first and foremost, I'd like to thank Payments Canada for the opportunity and the invitation to speak here today, and thank all of you for being here. As I was thinking about this talk over the last week, uh, you know, one theme kept coming to my mind, and you just heard Jennifer mention it as well, and I think it's pretty much the theme of the industry and this conference today, and, and that theme is change. Certainly, I'm preaching to the choir when talking to the Canadian payments uh, community when I mention change. Uh, SWIFT is not immune to these changes. When I arrived five years ago, we were talking about things like connectivity and resiliency and messaging. Certainly still very important, but today the conversation is more around things like innovation and cybersecurity and financial crime compliance. Interesting timing. I, I, uh, change in my personal life was the third theme of change that, came to, that, that uh, kept resonating with me. And I just took the uh, position here to have a management role and leadership role here in Canada. And the timing was interesting because my brother, about four months ago, just got his permanent residence card and he relocated from the United States to Whistler. Um, so then I was talking to my family about this opportunity and I was telling them that their brother will one day be able to send them real-time payments for on, his birthday, on their birthdays. And you can imagine the excitement that was on their faces when I told them about this uh, conference here. Well, you don't have to imagine that. You can see it right here. <laughs> but certainly you can tell they're young, they're about five and two, so as much as I wish it were true, this is not their excitement level over a payments conference. But the one on the right there that you see is my son, and, and that is the actual reaction he had the first time I ever brought him a Kinder Surprise Egg. <laughs> and how did he know about Kinder Surprise Eggs? Because we don't have them in the US. YouTube, of course. Technological change, because he's on YouTube. So after we fix global cross-border payments, let's tackle cross-border chocolate eggs. When I arrived at business school, I was a pretty naive guy. I spent about nine months in the real world. I remember a professor teaching us about things like continuous improvement and shaving a penny off per unit costs and Six Sigma people following you to the bathroom to count your steps. I remember thinking, wow, what bastions of efficiency large corporations must be. And then, I got into the real world. People scotch taping receipts on paper for their expense reports. I had a $100 billion uh, asset manager that was initiating payments via fax. And I was working with a Fortune 1000 company in the United States that was 98% check writing, 98%. Now granted that was 10 years ago, but that shocked me. I came out of business school and I had an existential crisis thinking that they just lied to me for two years. So. <laughs> So here we are, fast forward a decade, and we're still talking about the death of the check. I heard it here yesterday, I heard it around the conference. They're still talking about it here in North America. So here's a crazy statement. We will have global, real-time payments around the world before the death of the check in North America. And more about the how in a minute. So another area where I was naive was around standards, and I was pretty much naive until five years ago until I arrived at Swift. I figured standards must are, exist to make things simple. They must be standardized. And then, of course, the real world slapped me in the face again. And you heard yesterday in the great session on ISO 20022 that EDI was like the Baskin Robbins of, of file formats with all its flavors. I learned that there were hundreds of iterations of an MT101 even for a single banking institution. I had a large global transaction bank working with a joint client of ours, a large corporation, this is about six months ago, asking them to put a three-letter acronym, three-letter acronym, in front of the account number in the account number field of their ISO 20022 payment instruction. So here is my ask for the Canadian community. Please continue to do the work on harmonization that you're doing now, the hard work. It, it will be worth it in the end, but certainly, this is Canada, you're Canadians, you typically get things right, like healthcare and hockey. So I'm confident that this will be no different. Another area where I was pretty naive was around corporate payments themselves. Surely a large corporation, it, a bastion of efficiency, knows exactly where all of its money is at any given time, knows how much money will arrive at the vendor when they push the button to pay them. Again, I was pretty wrong. That area was ripe for innovation. On the screen here, you'll see the three areas of strategic focus for SWIFT these days. But we also look at this slide, and it reminds us that, especially in the payments industry, you have to balance innovation with risk management. And innovation is a process. You have to go from great idea to conversion to a product or service to proliferation to really drive change. So I think we heard Jerry yesterday say that one way that we can do this, uh, and one way we can strike that balance uh, pretty effectively, is through innovating on top of existing infrastructures leveraging the processes and procedures that you all have put in place around things like regulatory compliance. 
That's exactly what's happened with Swift GPI. So two things were going on in the world around us that led us to Swift GPI in, in relatively short order. Uh, first was the changing expectations of the customers. We had people obviously asking, how come I can track my $10 package from all the way to my front door, but I can't track my billion dollar payment the minute it's left my bank? The second was the threat of new entrants. So certainly we have the fintechs and everyone else coming to those clients saying, I have a better user experience for you, I can solve your problems. And it's amazing how motivated banks will get when you have clients demanding something and someone else telling them they're going to deliver it for them. So a number of banks got together and launched Swift GPI to provide that better user experience and to solve for the four key pain points that they identified in their conversations with those clients. So GPI is basically, a, uh, those banks got together, created an SLA rule book. Uh, and again, to address these four areas, and you see them on the screen there. The first was speed. The SLA calls for same-day use of funds, so that's the minimum bar. As you can see there on one of the stats, 50% of GPI payments are settling within 30 minutes. The leading banks are settling 65% of their payments in less than five minutes, and many, many of them are being measured in seconds. The second is transparency of fees, so understanding how much it will cost in each leg of the chain for an international payment. To, uh, to be processed. How much will my vendor receive on the other side? The third is traceability. If you want to track your payments like you do your Amazon packages, what do you need? You need a tracking number and you need a user interface. And that's exactly what GPI has provided. And you see a picture of the user interface there. There's a unique identifier on each transaction and you have an overlay platform that leverages APIs to, to grab the information from each of the banks in the chain and make that information visible to all parties. So you can imagine the, the benefits that start to accrue with all of that visibility. And you see one stat there on 50% reduction in banks' inquiry costs. You know, when's the last time you called Uber to ask them when the driver was going to arrive? Right? All that can go away. Imagine the working capital and cash management benefits you can get if you actually saw the inbound payments coming your way. So a lot of interesting benefits that start to accrue. The fourth was remittance data. The banks all agreed that remittance data that was traveling with these payments would not be truncated or altered in any way. So you can imagine the benefits that you see on the reconciliation side of the coin as well. And then if you expand the idea a little further, you can imagine another overlay service that's APIing with different systems and grabbing invoice number, PO number, bill of lading information, UETR, the tracking number on a GPI payment. So you start to see huge benefits uh, when you think about it that way on the, on the reconciliation side. Certainly a strong roadmap for GPI as well. We have things like stop and recall that will allow you to send a notification right to the bank in the chain, help you with fraud prevention. Um, we're looking at things like international payment assistance so that you can ping the bank and verify the Benny information and account numbers on those payments before they're initiated to get to 100% STP, hopefully. And third, but you know, last but not least, is certainly the global real-time payments that I mentioned before the death of the check. If you have a GPI leg as the cross-border leg with two banks that are connected to their respective domestic infrastructures, you can start to imagine a world where we have a global real-time payments network. So we're well on our way to GPI becoming the norm by 2020, that's our goal. And speaking about 2020 and the future and the roadmap, let's talk a little bit more about that future. We've heard a lot about new technologies, emerging technologies in the payment space. Uh, two stories I'll share with you and then I'll touch on DLT. The first is APIs. So I just talked about GPI leveraging APIs. APIs have been around for decades. Web APIs have been around in their current form since about 2005, so we're about 13 years from that point. And certainly we're now, it's all the rage today in, in the payments uh, industry. So you have APIs, you have Uber-like solutions, or Uber, and then you have GPI, which are Uber-like solutions in the financial services industry. So this is over a decade that we're talking about as far as timelines. Crypto assets, we've heard a lot about crypto assets throughout the conference. I was working for a supply chain finance company called Orbion in the early 2000s. That company was founded as a joint venture between Citigroup and SAP. And one of the founding ideas of that company came out of the Citigroup Innovation Lab, and that was crypto assets. Why do we need to use fiat currencies in this supply chain finance solution? We could use what was then called Orbian coin. That was 1999 when it was founded. So as we all recall, what was going on then was another technological innovation that was going to render banks obsolete, and that was the internet. 
So fast forward 20 years, we heard yesterday at the conference that we're still in the payments world, we're still in its infancy when it comes to crypto assets and, and payments. So these things take time. That's a 20 year cycle. So DLT, I think we'll see the same with DLT, and this is where I'll, agree, I'll disagree with about 38% of you from the poll yesterday that think payments will be uh, one of the first industries disrupted or changed uh, with DLT. I think what you'll see is DLT will proliferate in other areas and industries. So things, uh, we heard about it here with the supply chain management example of avocados yesterday. Uh, I think things like P2P renewable energy trading, it's kind of a new area. Um, digital identity, I've been reading a lot about. We heard about that here as well, I believe. The tech companies are working in that regard. I've never had control or ownership of my digital identity, so that's fairly new. So those things make complete sense for a DLT platform, and I think you'll see it proliferate there before it comes in on the DLT side. And SWIFT did one of the largest DLT POCs for the financial services industry with 34 member banks, and that's pretty much what they found. We found that it's definitely not a matter of if, but when, but when is the question, because it's not ready to scale to support mission-critical market infrastructures today. So it will take time, and certainly the banks also need to be ready to update these DLT platforms in real time. We have to move from batch to real time. So these things will happen. They will, it will be an evolution, not a revolution, big bang type approach. So I'm gonna kind of mirror or echo a little bit of what uh, Alan said earlier today and say that what, it's important, if I think about the quote that's on the, on the screen there now, it is important that we look to the future and we plan for these things, but let's not keep our eye off the ball of what's happening around us in the here and now. I do think we should be talking a little bit more about the, uh, the disintermediation that's happened in, in Asia uh, with the big tech companies and their apps. Uh, I haven't heard a lot about uh, PayPal's announcement recently that this year they'll have FDIC insurance on PayPal accounts. So what does that do to our retail client base uh, as bankers? So very important to look to the future, but don't look so far into the future. These things take decades, some of them that we're talking about, that you miss out on what's gonna happen in the next six to 18 months. So in closing, I think that collaboration is certainly at an all-time high. As a naive guy that I talked about 10, 12 years ago, if you told me that things like modernization would be happening, the harmonization conversations would be going on, Swift GPI would be possible, I would have told you you're kind of crazy. And also I had a British friend of mine who said, I really like Canadians. They're like Americans, only smarter. <laughs> so with your collective ability to adapt to change and all the collaboration that's going on, Let's continue to do the hard work together because it'll be worth it in the end. And with that, I really believe the future is bright. And as the father of two little ones, that makes me especially happy. Thank you.